Thank you, Collier and team, for leading us in that time. The Lord bless each and every one of you for being here this morning. I'm thankful and grateful to see you, praying that indeed today might be a special day of worship, of encountering the Spirit of the living God, and of being fed by His goodness as we fix and turn our gaze upon Him. Thank you for being here this morning. If you're new here, or if you've been here for a long time, just a fresh reminder, we're in the Gospel of Luke. We're in uh, going through a little study in the Gospel of Luke over the past good little while, and today we find ourselves in Luke chapter 16. We're going to backtrack just a bit from where Pastor Josh was last Sunday and pick up a few pieces that we left undone a few weeks ago in Luke chapter 16. We've just come through the first 16 verses, excuse me, the first 13 verses of Luke chapter 13, and there we find that Jesus is highlighting the importance of kingdom values, and he uses money and resources and possessions as kind of a way to zero in on establishing and highlighting those kingdom values in our life. Jesus is clearly calling us to a deeper thing than just what we can see and what we can touch and what we can feel. He's calling us to a deeper walk. And now, as we zero in on this next grouping of verses, we find in response to what Jesus has just said, in establishing these kingdom values and exhorting the people there and using an example of an unwise, foolish manager or steward to highlight that, the Pharisees and those in the audience are now returning that teaching or that proclamation by Jesus with some scoffing, with some ridicule. And with some deriding and mocking comments, perhaps, were going on there. Completely contradicting what Jesus had had to say. Why? Because their lives were intertwined directly to what he was warning against and what he was teaching against. And so we pick up the passage of Scripture today in Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16 with Jesus' response then to the Pharisees' rebuke. And there we find another section of perplexing verses. So verses 1 through 13, we scratched our heads a bit as we sorted through some of that. And today we pick up four verses in which we find many more perplexing things. A quick little exercise that I uh, want to just throw out at you, and I pray that uh, the box cover doesn't serve as a distraction to you. Uh, so, because you're either uh, might think of wanting to pet a kitty or uh, to take them to the local pound and destroy them. Uh, ever, I, I, yeah, so I pray that that doesn't serve as a distraction to you. But I want us to think of these verses to help us kind of sort through all of this. The first 13 verses as the front cover to the box, right? So Jesus is calling, as I just mentioned, as we just talked through, Jesus is calling us to a new standard of living, a deeper walk, one that is focused not just on what we can grasp hold of with our hands and what we can hold on to for ourselves to make our lives better, but he's, he's sinking it into a little deeper area of who we are, our hearts. And there we find that he, through this illustration, he's establishing some of those values. And so the first 13 verses, the, the, the example of the foolish manager or the dishonest steward, that's our front cover. Excuse me. That's our front cover. That's what he said, right? Now, in the middle there, or inside the box, we find the four verses that we come across today. And right now, they may seem like a big mess, right? We're looking at that and we're wondering how in the world those 750 pieces are going to fit together to make this, right? And let's think of the last section of verses, 19 through the end of the chapter then, as the back cover, the back, the back part of the box that holds all these things together, this is what we're going for, right? This is what he's establishing. He's giving us an example. This is how it sorts out. This is how we make up this. And this now is what holds it all together, right? So let's use that as kind of an example as we read through these next grouping of verses. And before we do that, I'd like to just pray and ask the Lord Jesus to help us as we walk through this. Heavenly Father, we bow before you this morning, giving you thanks for this day of life, for this day of new gifts that you pour upon us, for the blessing of your love, for the blessing of your grace and your mercy, and for the benefit of this fellowship to come together to seek your face. Lord Jesus, I pray that whether this is the first time or the 100th time or the 80th year time, that today might be a new day 
a new dawning within us as we sang with that blast from the past that today might be a time where you flip on a light inside in a way that we've never experienced before. By the power of the living God, the spirit of the living one, the one who is reigning on his throne right now, the one who has placed the highest mountains on this earth, the one who has established the deepest of the oceans, and the one who has spanned the expanse of the skies that we can't even begin to measure. Almighty one, we turn to you this morning and we pray, Lord Jesus, in the power and the authority of your name, that if there has been or if there is currently a distraction here this morning that has kept us from or has stumbled us up in our worship and reverence and adoration of you this morning, that in the name of Jesus you would bind up and cast that distraction from this place. That as we open up your word that you have given to us and blessed us with, the living word of God, the inspired words of the Almighty One, that the spirit of the living God would then be our teacher as we examine the words that we find on this page. Oh Lord Jesus, I pray, may you be glorified in this place. May the blood that was shed on Calvary that you offer to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness, may it be that very blood and the beauty of your work within us, Lord Jesus, that is glorified in us and through us, that our lights might be illuminated and might be fueled and burning ever more brightly as we leave this place. So may the name of Jesus be glorified as we open up our Bibles and read from Luke chapter 16, beginning in verse 10. Would you join with me? Luke chapter 16, verse 10 says this, One who is faithful in a very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, whose will give, who will give you that which is... Excuse me, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, or God and possessions, or God and material things. The Pharisees, here we go, the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things, and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men. But God knows your hearts, for what is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom of God is preached, and everyone forces his way into it. But it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one dot of the law to become void. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Here comes the back cover now that helps us realize and understand what he has just said, the consequence of the choice and the offering that he has just given to us. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus covered with sores who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime... That you in your lifetime received your good things, and Lazarus in manner, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, "Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send to send to him my." Send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. 
He said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. So a couple weeks ago, we unpacked that first grouping of verses that was a bit confusing in the way it all fleshed out, right? And now we come to the pieces of the puzzle that begin explaining what he meant in this last grouping of verses. We won't expound too much on it, but he's demonstrating the consequence of the choice that we've been offered. It's kingdom values or it's earthly passions, right? And these pieces in between, he's establishing in it, and these last shore up what he's just unpacked. I just want to help us understand that, all right? So we've dumped out the pieces, right? We've fleshed it out. There it is. <laughs> we've covered what means what, right? And now we come to Jesus' response to the Pharisees' rebuke. Before we cast too many stones at verse 14 at what the Pharisees and how they respond with shuffling up their noses and deriding and mocking and mocking Jesus for what he said I wonder how often perhaps we find ourselves doing the exact same thing at what Jesus has just offered to us here in our hands in the back pocket or what you're holding right now is the very word of God the encouragement and admonition of the will and desire for us in this life Yet far too often, we do exactly as the Pharisees did in their response and, oh, give up a few hours of my work day to help that guy? Hmm, not sure I'm going to. Give my vehicle for that? <laughs> give my advice in this? Hmm, you see what's happening here? So before we throw too many stones, let's do a self-check really quick of our own hearts and our own examination of where we stand in relation to those kingdom values that Jesus has just established. It's this narrow-minded focus, verse 15, this self-centered desire of always wanting more and, and wanting to attain greater things, this choice of loyalty and values in our lives. It's this very thing that Jesus says, if you choose to chase after those fleshly things, the things of this world, they actually become disgusting and repugnant, and you yourself walk in a place of rejection with God. No matter how shiny we make the lamp on the outside, no matter how shiny we make the outside cover and how polished it may be, verse 15, you will never fool God. He is the one who discerns our thoughts. He is the one who measures the motive and intents of our hearts. Proverbs 21.2 says this, Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. God knows our hearts. He knows if your ears are closed. He knows if you're hearing the cry of the weak or the vulnerable. He knows if your heart is truly, as Matthew 6.33 says, seeking after him and his righteousness. God says whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life righteousness and honor so Jesus is proclaiming this truth emphatically and with authority as he raises the standards now for obedience and allegiance to reflect a total character that is filled with an incredible amount of integrity service and honor to him much as the same as much the same as we did in that first gospel, uh, first recording of Jesus preaching in that synagogue way back in Luke chapter four. Not sure if any of you remember that, but Jesus said, "Today I'm here to proclaim liberty for the captive. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your presence." And he sat down. Jesus is doing somewhat of that same thing again as he begins to unpack what he's just said with the story of the unwise servant. He's saying, "Today, up until this point." Up until this point, you've had the Old Testament, you've had the law, you've had the prophets. John the Baptist was kind of the culmination of that. And now John the Baptist and Jesus, they serve as the dividing line. And Jesus says, now a new era is dawning. It's the gospel of the kingdom that is being preached. A new set of values is being established here. It's as if Jesus is saying, the law and the prophets were indeed until John the Baptist. That's the Old Testament dispensation which was primarily confined to the children of Israel or the Jews or those who became like the Jews and were somehow uh, uh, grafted in as a foreigner for a period of time, which caused you guys, Jesus is pointing back, which caused you guys to think you had the monopoly on righteousness and on salvation, to make you, think, to make you guys think that you were somehow high and mighty, esteemed among men, that somehow you had the inside track to God and the others didn't. But I tell you, Jesus announces with this shift now, 
(laughs) This other side of the line now that's beginning to dawn amongst them. But I tell you, since John the Baptist, something greater has appeared. The kingdom of God is being preached. A new covenant has appeared. It's the appearance of the new... alike, welcoming all who will to come in, all who will believe and, and understand and seek after this gospel message being preached. Hebrews 8 says this, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since, is, since it is enacted on better promises. He says in the in between, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, repeating the prophet Jeremiah, when I will establish a new covenant, I will put my law into their minds, in their hearts, write them on the lining of their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And they will know from the least to the greatest that I am the Lord God. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. Look back at verse 16. It's really not as controversial as we may think initially. Jesus is saying, guys, wake up. Salvation is not just for the Jews, not just by obeying the law to the T, polishing the outside, but salvation is for anyone who will believe this new kingdom gospel being preached. It's for any individual, no matter who or where you come from or where you've been, It's a personal concern. It's an individual matter specific to one individual. When a person realizes, one commentator says, and is convinced that a soul, that he has a soul to save and an eternity to provide for, they they thrust themselves toward it in order to get in lest they come up short. That's an urgency that requires great force of which Jesus is now referencing. When you match up the wording there in verse 16 that talks about, and everyone is forcing their way in. Some of your translations may say, and everyone is pressing towards it. If you match that wording up to another place, we find Jesus saying a similar thing in Matthew chapter 11, where he says, in referencing a real violence now, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. In other words, he may be referencing King Herod and those who have been trying to take it back or to take it away. So if you match the way it comes out in a much more passive way here in verse 16 versus the outward criminal uh, acts that are taking place, then it seems that verse 16 might be saying to us that exercising a faith that brings one into a firm belief and establishment in this gospel message of which I'm presenting to you takes an effort on one's part. It takes a force Not clearly seen from the outside, but from within. Not a force that leaves people with bruises and black and blue eyes. Not one that is criminal in nature, but a force towards one's own self, one's own selfish desires, those earthly and fleshly passions that burn within us. The word force there, you could say then that Jesus is referencing things like repentance. Something that is not usually easy to come to. Battling against self-denial and living in a walk in alignment with God's will, which takes a surrender and a humility on our parts, that's not a place that is easily arrived at oftentimes. It takes a force to get to that place. Remember chapter 14 where Jesus said, pick up your cross daily and follow after me? How many of us could raise our hands and say confidently, oh yeah, every day, man, I'm, I, I'm picking it up and I'm walking the walk. Hmm. Praise God, we may be able to say that, but it takes some effort, it takes some force, it takes some work and some pressing in. That's a hard battle. That's a spiritual war that oftentimes goes on within us. Those of us who are in Christ Jesus, as we said this morning, sang this morning, those who have been washed by the precious blood of the Lamb, 
You can say and agree with the scriptures confidently this morning that yes, indeed, I am a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. The old me has been crucified with Christ. The new me, now hidden in Jesus, is rising up with that same newness of life, that same power that brought him up out of the grave. That is reason to say hallelujah, friends. But that spirit of the living God that lives within us goes to war every day with those old ideas, those old patterns, those old thought processes that seek to resurrect the old you that has been crucified. Romans 6, 11 through 14. It takes an effort. It takes a work. It takes a force. It takes a pressing in <laughs> to turn the instruments that were once used for darkness into instruments of righteousness. That's a work. That's a force. That's a battle that goes on. That's what it means to take the for, use force to come into the kingdom. It's not an easy process. One commentary says this, those that would go to heaven must take pains. They must strive against the stream. They must press against the crowd that is going the opposite way. These efforts require a holy violence to accomplish. Forcing every thought into captivity, into obedience of Jesus Christ, that's a battle, friends. And if you've come to a place where you don't even have to pull out your sword anymore to fight against that, I need to talk to you. <laughs> I need to talk to you. This is not meant to belittle the power of the living God dwelling within us who have been redeemed by the blood. But it's to say every day it is a serious conflict that goes on and it is not meant to be treated haphazardly or lightly or loosely. Matthew Henry says this, Many that make a great profession of religion have much knowledge. There it is. There they are. Jesus, how could you say that? Uh, we rebuke you. And abound in the exercise of devotion, are yet ruined by the love of the world. Nor does anything harden the heart more against the word of Christ. Let's put it all together. Many that make a great profession of religion have much knowledge and abound in the exercise, exercise of devotion, are yet ruined by the love of the world. The Pharisees missed it, right? Why? Because they couldn't give up what they had so tightly grasped hold of. Anyone who will force themselves past the selfish desires of flesh, anyone who will force themselves past the currents of the culture and the world around us and walk in the light of this new gospel kingdom message being preached will be welcomed into the presence of the Almighty One. Anyone who puts on the armor of this gospel kingdom and battles against the schemes of the devil, battles against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, battles against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, throwing off, thwarting off, fighting against the fiery darts of the evil one, the one who picks up their armor and fights daily will enter into the kingdom. The one engaged in the warfare of the kingdom's cause will enter into the great and rich reward of the kingdom. Thanks be to Jesus, amen, who rescued us from that place of bondage of sin and death and has given us his very own spirit. Please understand, friends, this message is not intended to, or these wording, the wording used here in verse 16 is not meant to say that somehow we have to muster up work on our own and that it's a works-based salvation. No, 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 no. Not at all. But this is what Paul then later writes in Philippians, let salvation be worked out within us. So the good work that God began in you, he will continue on for his will and his work to do his good pleasure, to give glory to him. It's not of our own doings. For 2,000 years, the Pharisees have been trying to polish the outside of the cup. For 2,000 years, they have been trying to polish the lamp. They have 613 some laws in their Mishnah, in their rule book, in their guidebook. We'll unpack later from Matthew. He says, unless your faith, unless your works exceed that of the Pharisees, you'll never enter in. So what are we saying here? That if we find another five to add to the 613, that somehow we'll be better than the Pharisees and enter in? No, not, in, not at all, not in any way, shape, or form. Jesus is focusing on the inside, the battle that rages within. And when we can establish that passion and that desire and that allowance for the Holy Spirit to have his way among us and in us, wow, it burns all the more brighter for him. Pressing past those, 
legalistic demands and facades of performance of the spirit of religion and pressing in the precious victorious arms of Jesus. <laughs> There's that puzzle again, right? It's a beginning, beginning to notice how some pieces are coming together. Jesus is saying with the back cover now, those last grouping of verses, this is, a, this is a consequence of our choice. We can choose to adopt the kingdom values and to enjoy the life of Lazarus in great and rich reward and glory, or we can choose to not fight at all against those earth, earthly passions, those fleshly desires, and suffer the consequences of torment. It's as if Jesus is saying right now, Right in the here and now, this new era of gospel preaching, there's an invitation extended to us. It won't be easy. It will take effort and force and battling against things around us. But the power that dwells now within you allows you to take a stand and to fight against. Verse 17, the piece of the set is actually a complement to verse 16 then helping the puzzle begin to fit together even more. Jesus isn't saying that the gospel message that was preached and that now is being preached is somehow taking out or voiding out what had been preached. So in other words, this new era of gospel kingdom preaching is not voiding out what has been said before. Jesus is saying that this new gospel message is actually here to fulfill, to complete, and to clarify God's intent and meaning for what John the Baptist and the law and the prophets were intended to do. The Old Testament scripture is part of the Bible and it will be for all of time. Second Timothy, notice the wording there. And from childhood you knew the sacred writing. Sacred writings referencing what had been given to them. In another place, Romans 15, Paul says this, Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that, though, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. <laughs> so however many of the ceremonies and religious elements of the Old Testament, however many there were, those were foreshadowings. Those were pointing to and predictions of and promises to come, or, or promises of the coming Savior who now that he is here, new kingdom, new era, that he's saying now on this side of, of John the Baptist, with his, fulfilling, excuse me, with his coming, he is now fulfilling the requirements of those ceremonies, of those re religious rites. Rites like circumcision and having to put a drop of blood on my thumb and on my finger and on my toe and on my ear for the priest to be acceptable. Sin is still sin. But those things that were once done back then in order to represent the holiness and the purity of God, those things setting apart the, His people, those things are now fulfilled in Christ Jesus. So Jesus is now the one who stands as the qualifier. Jesus is now the one who identifies, yes, he is my child. Welcome into the presence of the Lord. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, there it is, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. There it is, that force again, right? Takes some effort, takes some pressing in. It's that kingdom preaching and teaching that transforms people. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. It is the power of the gospel, the inspired word of God that leads people into the way of grace and truth where the fountain of living water now flows richly and freely from within, not as something I need to grasp from without. This is good news for us, my friends. Jesus is doing a new thing here, he's saying. I want to just take a moment and just zero in, perhaps you consider it a bit of a rabbit trail, but just zero in a bit on the application for us here today in the setting that we find ourselves. And this is not to belittle or judge or con condemn anyone, but it's just to cause us to be aware of God's intention and work and will and desire for us in our lives and in this community. 
we're doing a little different thing here, right? Not many of us have come from a setting where we find a church in the middle of a city. Most of us come from a place of a nice, quiet, peaceful country setting. Some of us come from a place where we've not seen too many people just walk in on a Sunday morning from who knows where. We're used to and expecting of everybody to, to be there that we know, and, to, and those are all wonderful things to be a part of. It's great to be a part of a body like that. And some of us, perhaps, we question ourselves and we bristle against the fact that we're branching out into areas that we've never been before. I welcome your questions of discernment. And last week you learned from Pastor John, Josh that rebuke actually is meant to be an uplifting thing, an encouraging thing. Those are all good things. But friends, I believe that the Spirit of the living God is stirring among us in a way that Jesus can be glorified in us and through us and out there in ways that we've never experienced before. That's a good thing. That is a good thing to see the work of God among us. Jesus is saying, I'm not tossing all those old things out. We don't need to fear that as we venture into these new areas that we've never experienced before, that we're introduced to people that we've never seen or heard from before and come from places that we have no idea how to deal with before. We don't have to be frightened by that and think that somehow that will throw out everything that we've seen, learned, or understood. No, 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 no. In fact, Jesus uses verse 18 then to clarify because the, the people have been used to, they've been accustomed to this type of thing. And so Jesus takes an example from their own walk to establish, I'm not throwing anything away here. But the closer that we walk to, to myself, to Jesus, <laughs> to this new kingdom value being established among us, the greater our power to overcome the fear and the threats of worry that press in around us that perhaps we're missing something, perhaps we'll lose something. Jesus has a lot to say about this issue of divorce and remarriage and Lord willing we'll come back next Sunday and we'll unpack it. Don't think that we're going to run away from it. But for our purposes today, Jesus is using this piece from out of nowhere. He throws in this verse on divorce and remarriage, on what happens and how it works and that type of thing you could say. He throws it in out of nowhere like we're talking about an unwise steward here and, and then we're talking about the rebuke against the Pharisees and then out of nowhere he throws this comment about divorce. We weren't even talking about marriage, were we? And here he is and he throws this in here. He's using it as a means to establish, it's not voided out, friends. Where we've come from, where we've been, those, the heritage that we receive, those are good things. Stand on that. Use that. As, as, as building blocks for your now battle against the enemy and for the kingdom being established within you. Don't throw it out. Build on it. But God is saying even something greater here is happening. And in fact, the comment that he uses in his establishment there in verse 18 with his comment on what happens and how it all looks is actually a higher standard than what the Pharisees had been accustomed to for years and years and years. And I'd just like to highlight that verse for you. All the way back, established in, in Genesis, he marches it out. We know that from the will of God, we know that God's desire was for two people, a man and a woman, to become one flesh, right? And through that time, there has been some things that have happened because of our own fleshly passions and desires. And I'm getting my verses mixed up here. I'm ahead of myself in my notes. But in all the way through the Old Testament, we find that people are tripping up. They're stumbling on this command. And even the very last book of the Old Testament, of their old di dispensation, of their old law, we find that God still, still is, has the same view on it, right? And now we find that Jesus is saying, yeah, but he's even adding an extra and a higher piece to it. And we'll talk more about it next Sunday to clarify this, so just don't get too confused with it today. But Jesus is saying that here among us for 2,000 years, friends, you guys have been grabbing hold of all of these things to polish the outside. But I bring a new standard to you, a, a, a deeper one, a more powerful one, a higher standard. I had it up there for you a, a minute ago in Matthew chapter 18. Here's what he said. If your hand or your foot cause you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet and to be thrown into eternal fire. And he says the same for the eye. He's not asking us to literally do that, but he's establishing a mindset within that is calling us to a higher standard. 
So I wonder, are we ready for that today? Are we ready to join the force? Are we ready to join the battle? Are we ready to battle against those things that pull us away? Because back to verse 15, we see that in Luke chapter 16, verse 15, those things that tear us away from the kingdom, where do they originate? Where are they birthed? Where do they grow? Where do they pick up steam? Where do they gain their ground in our lives? It's in the heart, right? It's in the heart. And what happens when the heart connects to the mind and the mind tells the body to act out? Oftentimes, we have a result of sin and a walking away from God. Jesus is not saying that everyone involved in divorce is a sinner in need of a Savior. No. But what we can say is that the heart that is fully devoted on Jesus, fighting daily to remain there, has a potential to eliminate the potential for divorce and remarriage down the road. There is a time and a place, I think, that we can deal with those things. But Jesus is using this as an example to help highlight and to illustrate everything else that he's just unpacked. It comes from within, that heart that is devoted to him, not from without, not on the outside. Romans 14, I didn't put it up here for us, but it says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever serves Jesus in this way is acceptable, acceptable to God and approved by men. The Pharisees were getting upset because as their facade was torn down, their hearts were revealed and they lose their steam. They lose their hierarchy amongst the people around them. Suddenly, they're not so special after all, right? Suddenly, they're also in need of the same God that they're throwing stones at around them. Kingdom values are set on integrity and faithful devotion, devotion to Jesus. That's the essence of our new character within. And as we come into alignment with his kingdom, then Jesus becomes our heart's greatest desire. And his spirit becomes the fuel that the life that we live now needs and feeds off of. Which will illuminate and transcend into all the things around us. Relationships, marriages, our homes, our children, our communities, our checkbooks, our businesses. Everything begins to be affected by the kingdom of God dwelling within us. This isn't an easy pill to swallow, is it guys? Jason knows that. If you haven't, if it's easy for you to swallow down, I, I need to talk to you. This is a daily war that we're going through, that we're battling against. But friends, a heart that has been set upon Jesus, depending on his good work within us, that he promises to never quit, never give up, that good work within us, Paul writes in Philippians Will to do God's will and to do his work is all to bring him pleasure. For, excuse me, for his good and our pleasure. At his side, my friends, there are no worries or reason for concern that we've lost something or that something should be added to what Jesus has already said. Because being close to Jesus means we're being close to God. And being close to God means we're acceptable, we're one of his Last weekend at our camp out, I should probably have those fellows be preaching this morning, but we talked about so often times we want to know where the boundaries are. We want to know where the rules are, where the line is, where the guardrails are as we're heading down this path. And please understand, I, I think that it's biblical to have guidelines and, and things to steer us along the path that God has called us to. But friends, our concern should not be where the white line is at the edge of the road or how close I can get to the guardrail before I fall off the side of the cliff. That ought not to be our concern. Our concern is devoting and being close to the heart of Jesus. And when we're, our devotion and our hearts are passionately pursuing Jesus, then suddenly our eyes aren't fixed or worried about the sidelines or the guardrails or the boundaries because we know him full well and we're walking in alignment with him. Jesus being glorified within us when we're close to God 
It means our hearts and our lives are being filled. And when our hearts and our lives are being filled, that means we're being satisfied. And when we're being satisfied, that means that our lamps are burning all the more brighter as we pass press past the darkness, forcing our way through the current of culture and the world around us and beaming all the more gloriously for the glory of Christ Jesus himself. God being glorified in us and through us. My friends, that's what the walk is about. As we conclude, I just want it to be understood. We'll come back next week and unpack some tough stuff. But today, as we just throw around these perplexing verses, I hope it's beginning to make sense to you a bit. That inside this puzzle, inside this call to walk in alignment with the kingdom, to walk in alignment with Christ Jesus, these things are beginning to make sense and they're coming together in a way that you're beginning to put the pieces together. It's our prayer and our desire, friends, that no matter your position or no matter your level of understanding with things that we find in God's word, That you will know with certainty that our greatest resource, our greatest place to turn to for answers is the Word of God. And that from it we find the words of grace and life and truth. We find a new and living way that proclaims Jesus as the one who is victorious over all of the things that press in against us. And in Christ Jesus we can live victoriously and show the hope of Him To all the nations, I pray that can be our heart's burning passion and desire. Our prayer is that no matter your level of attachment or strength of beliefs with some of the sensitive subjects and things that we come across as we cipher out what they mean and what Jesus really meant, that you would never sense a harsh hand of condemnation coming down, but that you would always find the sweet and loving arms of Jesus that are ushering you in closer and closer to himself rather than pushing you further and further to the boundaries, to the sidelines, to the guardrails, to the edge of the cliff. Let's seek, friends, His amazing grace together and in that walk in the light of His glorious kingdom. He's given us the gospel. He's given us the map. He's given us the guide. And by the Spirit's power living within us, amen, we can walk in alignment with it. Let's stand as we pray together. At the conclusion of our prayer time and our worship team leading us in a concluding song of praise and worship, there's a prayer walk for those of you who are new to the area, new to, the, to, to our fellowship. So the first month of every Sunday, we just walk through the neighborhood. It's not a, it's not a perplexing, it's not a, a difficult thing to do, it's not meant to be just anything, uh, yeah, it's, it's not structured necessarily other than who we're praying to, Right? So today we'd like to begin something a bit new, and in the back of the foyer, or excuse me, in the back of the auditorium on the little end table and on the uh, table that underneath the bulletin board back here, you'll find just a small slip of paper. Four things that we'd start to be, that we want to start being a little bit more specific in our prayer. Number one is that we would have a Holy Spirit awakening within our own hearts and within the hearts of our community. Number two, that salvation found in Jesus Christ for souls out there would become real and alive around us and in us. And I just realized I didn't print off my last page. What was, uh, there's four of them. I, I wrote them down and I forget them. The third one was something. And the fourth one was <laughs> that the light of Christ Jesus would beam in to the homes. Oh, I know what it was. That we as a fellowship and as a body of believers here would be vessels that give glory to God to carry his message to our neighborhood and to our people, to the people around us. Amen? All right. So grab one on your way out if you want to take a quick walk through the neighborhood. You don't need to wait on anybody special to come and join you. Uh, The people beside you are special. Whoever you want to walk with is special. So grab one of those slips. And for those of you who aren't able to walk, please grab one as well and take it with you and begin praying that same prayer today. Heavenly Father, we bow before you at the conclusion of our time here and we thank you for your goodness to us heavenly father i pray that what the voice and the mind of a human being wasn't able to do that your spirit would come and would do your good work among us take lord god what you have offered to us in your word and build and expound and clarify and use it for edification in our walk in pursuit of you christ jesus 
that comes through the enablement and the help of your spirit, which we thank, thank you for, and we give you praise for. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just continue to help us to surrender our wills, which is not an easy process, to offer our lives as living sacrifices to you, to untie ourselves from all the weights that bog us down from this world, 